Hi, this is Voice of the St. Joseph Sports Network, Matt Martucci, and you're listening to Sports and Rants on Radio 1851. And we are back live with Paul Baca. This is Sports and Rants with Brett and Pants. I'm here with Brett Suits along with my co-host, Glenn Pantalone. And like I said, former Major League catcher Paul Baca is on live with us. Paul, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, fellas. Thank you. Thank you for coming on with us. We appreciate your time. Ah, of course. I uh, appreciate you guys extending uh, the invitation and, and look forward to catching up. So, baseball season has begun. Do you still get that itch to go out and play? Uh, you know what? I I don't know if it's an itch to go out and play, but you know, um, I think most guys that you'll visit with uh, will find that uh, around this time of year, at least get uh, at least get kind of antsy. You know, just having been fortunate to play for a number of years like I did and uh and just kinda I think your body just develops some kind of rhythm to where you you know, get get accustomed to home in the off season then around spring, uh springtime, you know, kinda get used to moving around and getting back in the flow of the season and uh and, and just being stuck at home and not having that opportunity anymore. You you kinda get a little restless and uh and a little antsy, you know, to kinda just start uh, moving around a little bit. Can you explain the transition from a full-time baseball player to what you do now? Uh, man, uh, I, I guess I can attempt to. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I think there's no uh, there's no formula. You know, there's no handbook that anybody gives you um, when you kind of exit in the game. And, uh, you know, first year or so, it's pretty strange. Just kind of getting back to some sense of normalcy, I guess, you know, and, and getting really adjusted to, to what we kind of former players call real life. You know I mean? You know, getting, getting to play in the big leagues for, you know, a day or a year or, or, or 10 years or longer, whatever the, the, the amount of time is, it's, it's really uh, such a privilege and, and such a joy that it doesn't seem like real life and, and getting back into, you know, the grind of, of everyday living, it, it takes some adjusting, but, uh, but after a couple, you know, a year or two, I guess, uh, you know, you just kind of develop other interests and, and get into something else to kind of keep you busy and, and try to stay productive in some capacity. So have you started watching the games of, since the season has started? Do you have any favorites so far that you think could be a World Series contender? Well, man, um, probably like most folks are saying, uh, you know, definitely with the pitching staff and, and even the position players behind it, I would say the, the Nationals look awfully strong on paper assuming that they stay healthy um you know for 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 my money they seem like the the definite uh favorite in either league right now and um you know as far as the american league uh i really don't have a, a clear favor to me right you know right now but uh what about you guys you have a, a distinct favorite in the american league right now um there's there's a toss up out there there's so many Different great teams, the Mariners are one that could be a sleeper this season. Also, the Rangers always are competitive, especially with Prince Fielder, guys like that. If everyone stays healthy, you never know. Right, no, I agree. I, I think it would be neat for the Mariners to uh, to win and kind of get back on the map, especially with, you know, Felix Fernandez. He's kind of, uh, you know, as good as and great as he is, he's still kind of flying under the radar somewhat, and I think uh, getting into the playoffs would help him uh really uh you know garner that notoriety that he deserves is there anybody that you enjoy watching a specific pitcher work on the mound that you now are seeing from a different perspective instead of watching from the dugout or catching now watching yeah. from your tv yeah for sure uh easy answers for for the most part i mean like someone like clayton kershaw is just uh just amazing um you know what he's doing and and uh and just actually i saw uh Matt Harvey's return to the mound yesterday, it was, you know, awfully impressive. And just to see how simple he's making it look, it looks like he's just playing catch uh, and throwing, you know, 95 to 97 miles an hour. It looks like uh, rather effortless and, and under control. I mean, Verlander, I mean, you know, Rollers Chapman. I mean, just, just guys that actually kind of um, – you know, kind of ooh and all you, or, or definitely the ones that are exciting to watch nowadays. You mentioned how they look effortless and under control. How much of, of that is on the catcher? Uh, man, not not a whole lot. I mean, it, it, it might be 
you know, he might catcher might get a little bit of credit or should get a little bit of credit maybe for, for calming a guy down through a tough, you know, situation in a ball game or through a rough start. But I mean, just, you know, when it comes to mechanics and, and a guy's delivery, I mean, that's all on the pitcher himself and the work that he's put in and, uh, and the work he's done with either that particular pitching coach or pitching coaches in, in years past that have, that have got him to be such a, a refined and, and, uh, and finished product. To go more into calming a pitcher down, what did you do specifically in your career that you found worked with pitchers that you've pitched, worked with? Uh, you know what? It, it, it varied. Um, I, I couldn't give you a, uh, an exact formula or, or even a, a particular instance. I don't have anything sticking out of my mind right now, but it, you know, Does it depend on the pitcher? Too vague, maybe? Exactly. Without trying to sign too, sound too vague, it, it just depends on each pitcher's personality and the situation. You know, some guys um, would calm down and maybe take a deep breath and relax in the moment when you would uh, provide some humor out there. You know, some guys would <laughs> would uh, would kind of respond better to, to believe it or not, just a little bit of a um, you know a little more aggressive thing, like a little bit more of a rah rah pitch and then some guys would uh would, would respond better just by distracting them and just kind of talking about random stuff so it just depended on the personality and it depended on the pitcher uh and and, and the type of pitcher he was as well was there ever that pitcher that you worked with that you would just walk out to the mound and know you didn't have to say anything and they would settle themselves down and get all of their mechanics back in order yeah i mean uh greg maddox uh who i was fortunate to be able to catch for uh for you know two or three years he uh he was uh he was kind of an autopilot i mean you know he, he could kind of adjust pitch to pitch and uh and most guys are hoping to adjust you know batter to batter or inning to inning he, he could make adjustments pitch to pitch and, and he knew his mechanics and so well and could repeat them so well that it was just a matter of just kind of calling time and and letting him almost clear his mind and, and gather himself versus uh me offering anything to to help out the situation. It was just him kind of basically pressing reset and, and getting back to, to what he could do. He's definitely the one that sticks out the most as far as being able to correct himself. During your career, did did you feel like specific pitchers would work want to work with you rather than another catcher on the staff? We saw it's Greg Maddox during your career. You worked a lot with him rather than Javi Lopez catching him. Is that just a preference of the pitcher or was it just – good a uh, karma between the two of you yeah i think uh maybe a combination of both you know i mean uh you know i think the way greg liked to look at it is that uh you know he uh starting catcher needs a rest regardless of of, of how good or how great they are and and and, and but that's that said, regardless of how bad the backup catcher is right i mean i, I clearly at some point it was obvious that I, I shouldn't have been a starting catcher, so there was a, a natural uh, opportunity to kind of go out there and play every fifth day or every sixth day with an off day in between, you know, for that starting pitcher's turn the rotation to where uh, it kind of worked out to where it was a good chance to give the, the starter a breather and get the backup catcher in the mix and, and develop a relationship with a particular pitcher. I, I don't think it was something that you, you plan out um, and, and kind of, Managers don't want to to have that situation. I think at, at all costs. So, getting back to your to the question regarding whether it's um, you know something that clicks with personalities or just the chemistry, I, I think sometimes it's that, and sometimes it's just a matter of um, you know starting catcher needing a, a day off once a week, and and a certain battery combination can kind of provide that and give him a breather at the same time. All right, we're on with Paul Baca, former Major League catcher. Paul, now we want to get a little bit in more depth into your career and how you got into baseball. Was there somebody that guided you to become a catcher? Was it something that was instilled in you early in your life? You know what? Um, I don't actually recall the, the, the reason why I got uh, put behind the plate, but I've been, I was catching since I was probably around 12 years old, and uh, you know, I think I always had a pretty good arm and and uh, and looking back on it now, now that I, I know so much more about the game and youth baseball, I, 
I probably stunk in the infield. I was probably too slow and uh, <laughs> and and not athletic enough to play shortstop. But you know, I could hit a little bit, had a good arm, and and uh, and I guess had some pretty good hands. But like I said, wasn't very athletic. And and uh, someone stuck me behind the plate at twelve or so, and I, I think I just absolutely loved it. And uh, and can, you know, caught all through high school and just realized that that was my best opportunity to to uh, try to keep playing as long as I could, and, and it just kind of stuck from there. Yeah, they say uh, the expression in baseball is the fastest way to get to the major leagues is being a g- very good catcher. Would you agree with that? Um, I, I wouldn't say the fastest way because, it, 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 you know, there's a learning curve in the minor leagues and professional baseball to where, you know, most, I'd say 99% of the guys in college catchers are not calling their own pitches to where, even if a guy has an idea um, of what to call and, and the rhyme and the reason why a pitching coach is calling stuff, he's still got to learn how to go do that on his own, to be responsible for what pitches are called, how to handle the pitchers like we talked about earlier, um, you know, when to fire them up, when to call them down, when to pat them on the back, when to kick them in the butt. All those things, you know, you can't just talk about them and learn them from a coach. you got to go out there and do them. Uh, and, and learn how to do that and, and manage people in the minor leagues to where it, it, I wouldn't say it's the fastest way. I, I would say that there's definitely a need for it. You know, I, I think um, a very valuable defensive catcher uh, is essential to any team. But uh, I wouldn't say the fastest way to the big leagues, but I would say maybe a, a surefire way to get to the big leagues would be to be a heck of a defensive catcher because there's always going to be a need for that, uh, especially with the with the way offense is kind of um, you know dwindling down in the big leagues to where you know defensive catchers and middle infielders and, and athletic center fielders and outfielders are becoming more and more important like they were before the uh, the era of the long ball, you know. Yeah. Now going off that real quickly, you talked about catchers calling their own pitchers. We see. In most cases, the catchers call their own call the pitches in major league games. But we still see those instances of the pitching coach giving signals from the dugout. In your case, did you prefer calling the game yourself or getting some input from the pitching coach? Yeah, no, no, no. We, uh, you know, what you're seeing there is probably just, uh, you know, the manager or in some cases, like you said, maybe a, a pitching coach or two putting on signs. And what they're doing is simply giving. Um, guidance to uh when they would want the pitcher to slide step uh to home plate to go quicker to the plate you know to give the catcher a better chance to throw the runner out or or throw a pickoff play on or uh, or throw a pitch out but uh the catcher um is is ultimately responsible for the pitch calling so uh you know nobody really offered pitch call suggestions once you get to the big leagues um you kind of talk about it between innings or after a game and just make sure everybody's on the same page because you can never stop learning, but um, ultimately it's the catcher's responsibility, the pitching coach or managers putting on pickoff plays. All right, now going back to your early career in baseball, you originally drafted out of high school and then would attend college. What made you decide that rather than going right into the majors or minor leagues? Okay. Uh, well, the Cleveland Indians drafted me out of high school, and uh, you know I was I was young. Um, pretty naive and and uh and they didn't they weren't the cleveland Indians today they were still playing the old stadium and uh <laughs> i think they were a year i think they were a year or two from jacobs field and it was just a different deal they didn't they didn't offer any type of uh incentive you know whether it be you know financial like a signing bonus or, or college uh education to really make it worthwhile to consider for going and uh and i'm, and I'm actually i'm very happy that they didn't because looking back on it i was nowhere near uh mature and ready to go play pro ball at that point you know i needed the three years in college and then sign after my junior year to uh to grow up a little bit and uh and just get ready to uh you know in, on and off the field to kind of go tackle pro ball a little bit later now what's your opinion of that we see guys coming right out of fresh out of high school going in the minors these top prospect guys that have all this pressure on them what's your opinion on guys going out of high school rather than college and do you think players should go to college well i i think that's just that's something that should be on a uh, case-by-case basis you know i mean looking back on it i was 17 when i got drafted i, I turned 18 in, in that that june but you know literally was was 17 when i got drafted to where some kids now are, are graduating high school 
18 and a half, 19. And if they were offered um, a significant amount of money and, uh, and their financial, their family's financial situation um, kind of landed itself to, to having the kid take the money and take his chances to make it to the big leagues that route, then I'd say, you know, you know, I'm, I'm all for that particular situation. But, you know, if a kid's, uh, you know, got a good head on his shoulders and, and, uh, and wants to get a college degree and uh, gets a chance to go play college ball, and uh, and and improve his hopefully improve his draft draft status and and also get an education at the same time. I'm, I'm for that. So I think it just depends on a case by case basis. For, for your case, you ended up going to the University of Southwest Louisiana. How did Louis? Why did you choose that school? And did that improve your draft status? Yeah, that's a very good question. I uh, it's actually a school that's uh, that was in my hometown. Uh, you know, there was I had some interest from other, I guess, more uh, noteworthy schools that you guys would have heard of uh, before reading where I went to school. Uh, they uh, they just didn't come in as, as, as strong and as aggressive, and uh, you know, and, and just being here in my hometown, uh, it made it very uh, affordable for my family, and uh, you know, it was it was basically a you know 100% full ride scholarship, and, and the baseball program was was and still is. Uh, you know, a good program, um, and uh, and you know we were a game or two away from reaching the College World Series my freshman year, and uh, and just kind of I guess fizzled a little bit after that freshman year. But uh, but it was an easy choice at the time. Like I said, I was 17, and uh, get a chance to play college ball in your hometown and make it easy on the family was uh, were were the biggest factors, I guess. One thing we love talking about on our show is that path that major leaguers take to get to there going through the minors for you like you said you stayed in your hometown for college what was it like leaving for the first time going to the minors there's long bus rides and that whole path to the major leagues man i, I like i was kind of we kind of talked about a minute ago just just the fact of growing up and maturing as a as a young man uh you know you're out there on your own for the first time not making a whole lot of money and and needing to you know budget your time budget your your finances and and uh learn a lot about responsibility and and professionalism uh you know there's there's nobody uh sitting there you know checking curfew and and making sure that you're doing what you need to do you're all you're responsible for yourself showing up on time and getting your work in and getting your extra work in when you need it and getting your rest and and trying to stay uh you know well fed and and hydrated and all those things that uh, you kind of take for granted when you're doing those on your own for the first time, uh, it, it, it's you know it's it's something that kind of opens your eyes and you realize that uh, you got to grow up rather quickly and uh, and it was it was a blast looking back on it. I think you talked to you talked to a bunch of guys that made it to the big leagues. Um, you know some of the most most fun times and and best memories, believe it or not, are some of those minor league bonds that uh, that you have, whether it's in a bus ride or hanging out at the hotel or, or some of those minor league ballparks with. Some of the funny stuff that goes on. Uh, it, it was a great, great time. Obviously, you don't want to stay there too long, and <laughs> everybody's goal is to, to blow through there. But just looking back and, and reminiscing a little bit, there's just some great, great times and great memories and, and friendships being made, uh, you know, through guys' past from in the minor leagues. Now, you had a long career playing for tons of teams. Was there any team that stuck out to you the most during your career? Was there a coach or somebody that you enjoyed playing for the most? Yeah, uh, there's two particular teams, you know, outside of the the obvious, like the first, you know, your first game, the first time you get called up, you know, just a, a lot of those firsts that are normal for everybody but uh, and, and, and stick out. But from a team concept, two teams that definitely stick out, uh, first and foremost in my mind, are the 2003 Cubs, which uh, was, I'm sure you guys remember the whole, uh, you know, kind of, Losing to the Marlins there in the, yeah. the quote unquote Bartman game and all that stuff, uh, and then 2009 Phillies. My last year playing ball was uh, was a an awesome group of guys. They I joined the you know joined the Phillies kind of during the season, and man, they welcomed me with uh, with open arms and uh, and and really really cherished and, and appreciated my time there. Now going off that, both of those teams, as everybody will recall, especially the the Cubs in '03 and the '09 Phillies, were very good team, great teams, and many people say 
should have been World Series champions. Mm-hmm. What what made those teams so great? And what was it? The coaching was it? Just the players, the core group of guys. Um, I think it was a combination of, of a bunch of things. I mean, not to take anything away from Charlie Manuel, uh, and and and, but but his his situation I think was a little bit more of a of a um, you know just keep the keep the ship going down the right path, considering how good those Phillies teams were during the during the the late 2000s there um and and he did a wonderful job of of maintaining what was going on there but uh but but dusty baker and with you know regarding the 03 cubs uh he was that was his first year there in 2003 uh about half the roster was new and fresh to where the you know the 02 cubs i'm pretty sure they finished last place and we came in with a whole new group of guys and uh you know won the division and as you know, we're uh, a few hours from from reaching that World Series, and and uh, just that turnaround, and, and you know, Dusty's managing style and getting everybody to buy in and believe that uh, it could be a quick turnaround was was awfully impressive. And and both of those teams, the Cubs, O three Cubs and O nine Phillies, both had a tremendous group of characters. That just you know, people talk about chemistry a lot, and that that both of those teams had great chemistry. But what made it, what made both of those Club's extra special was the chemistry involved, but then also the the character and charisma and, and just attitude of the guys. I mean, like you said, the core group of guys were um, very talented on both both accounts and uh, and very strong minded and very confident. And uh, they just kind of transcended down to from the from the best player on the team down to the twenty fifth guy. Now, going off that, like you said, Charlie Manuel kind of had an easier time, especially because the Phillies. Just the year prior, won the World Series, and like you said, just keeping the ship going. What what was your opinion of the World Series, and why do you think the team wasn't able to get over the hump? Mm, man, that's a tough one. Uh, look, I, I wasn't there in 2008, right? I was I was just a, a competitor against. I played for the Reds that year, and uh, you know, I think the team was was every bit as good. If you know. It, I have no idea, but maybe potentially, arguably even better, right? In 2009, on on paper, or but um, it comes down to making a couple pitches, a couple timely hits in a seven game series, and ends up being not necessarily the, the best team, but ends up being the hottest team. And uh, and you know, a couple balls bounce a different way, a couple pitches go a little different uh, route, and and uh, who knows, could have been back to back championships. But uh, it's it's hard to put your finger on you know, a a particular reason. Now, something I want to get into with you is one thing we see, you said that you played part-time backup starter role. What's it like sitting on the bench and trying to get in the mindset of knowing you're going to come in for a pinch hit, knowing you're going to be in a key spot eventually later in that game? Yeah, that that was probably the toughest part of the job was, uh, was even more so than not playing a lot and trying to stay sharp was knowing that at any moment, Starting catcher could hit get hit by a you know foul tip and break a finger or you know hurt a toe or or have a play at the plate and and uh, and kind of lose your starting catcher and kind of always having to be on standby you know basically for nine innings every night even when you weren't playing was pretty tough just mentally having to kind of not know yet be ready at the same time was was a pretty tough part of the job. Now being somebody that's played so long in the league we now recently have seen the changes with the catcher the rules and in my opinion a a change we're seeing a transition of catchers in general what are your thoughts on these new rules especially with avoiding contact at the plate um look i I personally i don't um like it very much just because i think it would being a catcher is is some some of what separates you um being a catcher from from all the other players that are you know as you know they're all facing the plate and as a catcher you're in charge back there and you're, and you're facing the whole field and everybody's everybody's watching you you know catch those pitches or frame those pitches or block the plate and and so what separates you is is a mindset and a and, you know sometimes a personality but just a just a mental toughness and and by taking away um, some of that and not necessarily having to block the plate. And uh, and having the, the 
you know, basically runners have to slide around you and stuff. I think it takes away a little bit from the job require, requirement of what a catcher uh, has been and, and, in my opinion, should be. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have the luxury of being in on those, those rules committees, but just <laughs> personal, personal opinion, I, I just think that it should have kind of still been uh, what it had been for, for X amount of years and, and it, you know, runs as, even nowadays, as we talked about a bit earlier, with uh, – with home runs going down and, and you know and pitching performance going up, those runs are even harder and harder to come by. To where it, it, I think blocking the plate is is an art form and a, and, a, and just a a very very important part of the game that is now kind of taken away at a time when uh, you know runs are even more valuable now than they were a few years back. Now, something you alluded to was the demand of a catcher, how difficult the position is, and how much of a strain it is on your body. We're seeing guys now transitioning from catcher and moving to first base towards the end of their career. Did you ever have any thoughts of that and moving from the catcher position? Man, if you go back and look at my uh, my you know hitting prowess or lack thereof, you realize that I had no choice but to catch. The only opportunity I'd have had to play another position would have been Maybe learn how to pitch, but, but uh, I, I didn't have the luxury of considering to go play another position, especially first base. You know, some of those guys you're talking about are, that are doing that, like you know, maybe Buster Posey. He's getting the mix in at first base now from time to time, and and uh, and uh, and then probably will be able to do that later in his career. Those are guys that are just exceptionally talented um, at the plate in the batter's box, and then and then are also plenty good enough to be a major league catcher. So those guys are just. They're they're an anomaly, and those are those are really the superstars of the game you're talking about. Obviously, what allowed you to be the great catcher that you were was your game management, and how do you handle the speedsters on the base pass differently uh, than another regular base runner? Man, that, that really, you know, that was really up to the pitcher to a certain point. You know, I mean, as far as trying to keep him close with the picking over the first base, or you know manager calling pitch outs at the appropriate time or, or or the pitcher giving you an opportunity, a better opportunity to throw out a, a fast guy by slide step into the plate and cutting down his release time to the plate. But, um, you know, we can only control, as defensive catchers, we can only control from the time the ball hit our mitt to the time uh, we get it down to the second baseman or shortstop there, hopefully on the back. And, uh, you know, that's all we can control to where if we tried to add on any more to that, that's when we kind of got in trouble and started making errant throws. So ultimately, it came down to the pitcher giving us a good chance uh, to throw the guy out, and, and, and hopefully that, that fast guy you're talking about didn't get that great of a job to give us a, a chance to even throw him out. Whether it's preparing for, before the game or during the game itself, possibly even with the guy on base, is there a different approach to the different types of pitchers, whether it's more of a finesse, Pitcher or velocity? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, it, it, you can't. You know, we all had our strengths and weaknesses, and and it wouldn't be fair for a pitcher to, you know, try to adjust his uh, his strengths or, or or adapt. You know, whether it be based on a base runner or a hitter, he's got to stick with his strengths first and foremost. And sometimes they're going to be good enough, and sometimes they're not. But uh, that's why we play so many games. Is that over the course of the season, all those averages will kind of average out, and uh, and, the, and the game kind of shows you uh, who's what and and, uh, and which teams are what over the long haul of the season. Now, looking back on your career now, is there a specific guy that stands out in your mind that you enjoyed most working with? And was there a moment in the majors that's one of your crowning achievements or most memorable moments for you? Um. As far as when you mean working with, you mean like a manager or a pitcher, a pitcher. Or, or well, um, man, there, there were just so many different uh, personalities and and uh, and uh, individuals that it'd be hard to to label that. I mean, it's just it's an easy fallback, I guess, uh, default answer for me to say Greg Maddox because I had the fortunate luxury of catching him for like I said two or three years and got to know him pretty well um personally and professionally so he, that would be the easy answer and then regarding um uh i mean there were just there were just too many to too many to uh consider other than him and what was the second part of your question i'm sorry uh 
what was your, your crowning achievement or most memorable moment yeah. during your career? Um, man, you know, getting to catch his 300th win, uh, it was a day game in San Francisco. That was a very cool moment. Uh, hitting a home run, um, off of Shane Reynolds in the 2001 divisional round, uh, for the Braves was awful cool individual moment for me, uh, considering I was getting the play then and, and Javi, uh, Lopez was injured for the first round of playoffs. Um, that Cubs team getting to play uh, a decent bit in the playoffs there. And, and uh, man, I, it wasn't an achievement, but something I'll obviously remember for the rest of my life is uh, being behind the plate for the the Bartman incident and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you know, kind of catching Mark Pryor during his heyday there when uh, he was virtually unhittable. Uh, and then, look, um, you know, just kind of getting – Back, uh, joining the Phillies 2009, kind of mid-season, sometime in early June, after uh, getting released by the Cubs at the end of spring training, coming home for you know four to six weeks, and then uh, and then going to uh, get to join those guys was uh, honestly was was right up there with all the other moments that I described, just from the fact that I uh, I was able to cherish and and really really appreciate getting to play in the big leagues and especially on a team with a with a, a proven winner with the uh with the players and the and the character and the chemistry of that clubhouse was something I'll I'll always remember just the way that they welcomed me like one of their own from day one and uh and uh and I really appreciate that. Now as you wrap up the interview here, could you just tell our listeners what you're doing now since your retirement from baseball? Sure, sure. I'm uh I am in commercial real estate here in Lafayette, Louisiana, and uh, and uh, involved in industrial, you know, retail and, and multifamily real estate, and, and having a blast doing deals down here, and uh, raising a couple kids, and, and with my wife Lori, my daughter Abby, my son Will, um, and uh, and just living life, like I said, day to day, and that's just now that I'm adjusted, it's been a few years, and uh, and enjoying and appreciating every moment that I have here with them now. Any thoughts of ever getting into coaching? Yeah, I definitely. I do. And and uh my daughter's 17 and my son is 13 and uh and I trying to, you know, maintain some communication with some, a couple of different relationships that I have in the game and I, I definitely have interest. It's just not the right time for me. As you saw the as you were alluding to, I I played for so many different teams that our lifestyle was crazy. We were never settled in the same city uh for more than one year basically. To where you know got a lot of catching up to do at home and, and try to give my kids some sense of normalcy before getting back into that. Would you want to coach at the major league or minor league re- level? Was do you have a preference there? Uh, I mean, I, I I would prefer the big leagues, but I mean, heck, we can't always draw it up. You know, <laughs> sometimes you might have to uh, work your way back up. But but who knows? We'll see. And uh, and I look forward to that day when it comes, uh, and, and hopefully have an opportunity there at some point as well. All right, Paul, thank you for joining us today. We learned a lot, and we loved hearing your stories and looking back on your career with you. All right, fellas. Well, look, I appreciate the invite, and, uh, and you'll have a great uh, great season. Hopefully, Phillies uh, have a great season, and, uh, and y'all take care now. All right, bye-bye. Thank you again. Okay, bye-bye. This concludes our podcast of Sports and Rants with Brent and Pan. Thank you for listening. Please follow us on Twitter at Sports and Rants. Like us on Facebook. Remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And visit our website, www.sportsandrants.blogspot.com. It would help our rankings on iTunes if you rate and review our podcast. Thanks, and have a good day.